red granite folds down and the black begins and it's a dividing line that is like night and day. In some light it actually has a blue tinge to it and one of the verses in scripture talks about the top of the mountain as if it were a sapphire stone. Especially toward noonday, it gets a shiny patina on it to where it looks like you're walking around on obsidian. It is literally that shiny and that black. Basically, there are three different kinds of rocks. These are igneous rocks, those that are formed from volcanic activity. Then there are sedimentary rocks which are formed under the oceans, under the lakes, and in riverbeds, and so on. And then there's a third variety called metamorphic rocks. And metamorphic rocks are those that are recrystallized under temperature and pressure conditions. As a matter of fact, interestingly enough, uh, when I looked at the thin section, it told me that it is a metamorphic rock. When you stand there and you look all the way around you, there are convoluted mountain ranges going off in every direction. And there are none that are the color of the one you're standing on. It is black, and every bit of the rest of it is a red burnished brownish granite as far as the eye can see. From high atop the mountain, Jim and Penny see the V-shaped altar of sacrifice. The altar of sacrifice is what inspired us to continue to go back to the mountain. This is where the pillars are. And what are they doing there? These huge stone pillars. Again, civilization would have been required to construct these. It says in chapter 24 of Exodus that Moses got up early, he erected 12 pillars, he built an altar there at the base of the mountain, and then he brings oxen in for sacrifice. Recent excavations show evidence of ancient ash deep in the soil at this site. The 12 pillars were signifying the 12 tribes of Israel. What would we have for pillars? We found these white stone pillars, about 22, 24 inches in diameter. They're kind of a white, soft, marble-ish type material. They would have stacked right on top of one another. Uh, ancient Egyptian photographs show that this is a style of building a, a pillar-type formation. Now, we don't know it's an altar. It, it, it's a rock formation, whatever it is, but I mean, what is it doing there? And, and why 12 pillars? And, and why not nine? Why not 14? Why 12? The Bible says it was of uncut stone and no steps. I mean, the precision of, of Scripture in here is amazing because it calls out that this altar is located right at the foot of the mountain. And sure enough, there it sat. From that moment forward, it was my mission, Penny and I together and the kids, we were going to document everything we could about it. Because our greatest fear was that once the Saudis realized exactly what they may have, they would come in with bulldozers and eliminate it. Jim Caldwell is able to explore the cave that Bob and Larry could only see from a distance. It is dead front of the mountain. It was a lot higher than I thought it was. The entrance looks small. It's 15 feet high. It's a big cave. I was able to climb into it. It's about 20 feet deep. There is a place for somebody to bed down in the back of it. One of the things I did is when I was walking to the back of it, I swung around with my video camera, and the view was awe-inspiring. You could see the Golden Calf Altar, the plain where the thousands of tents would have been located out there. The Caldwells will visit the mountain a total of 14 times over a period of eight years, camping in different locations each time to increase their chances of finding more archaeological sites. Their confidence that Jebel al Az is the real Mount Sinai begins to deepen as they find several more distinctive, though puzzling items around the mountain. Amazing because of its rarity, a lone cedar tree comes into view. The trunk of this enormous tree is eight feet wide and clearly shows its age. Even smaller olive trees in Israel have been dated at more than 2,000 years old. Exodus chapter 3 records that God spoke to Moses in the form of a burning bush. Jim and Penny can't help but wonder, could this be the very plant? 
The Caldwells also find numerous almond trees around the mountain, significant because of how they lend credibility to the account of Aaron's rod made of almond wood, which budded and produced ripe almonds, according to Numbers 17.8. Additionally, quail can be seen all over the area. It is theorized that they fly in huge numbers over the Red Sea from Egypt, only to fall to the ground exhausted on the Arabian side. Exodus 16.13 records that in the evening, quail covered the camp of the Israelites. Jim and Penny also find grinding stones, spear points, and other sorts of weapons, all fashioned in the Egyptian style, which the Israelites would have learned during their 400 years of slavery in Egypt. But the most compelling of their discoveries is also the most mysterious. I think the greatest find around this mountain was the split rock discovery. We had nothing to do with the split rock discovery. It was brought to our attention by the Caldwell family. This to me is the real nail in this whole thing that drives it home that this is the real Mount Sinai. And we came up to a break in the rocks and I looked over from the north looking due south and both of us were just stunned. There two miles away was a monolith that just stood out in the landscape. In that valley there are numerous natural outcroppings of hills that are just comprised of boulders and then there is this one with this massive rock sitting atop of it. From a distance it's big. When you're close to it, it is enormous. It's four stories tall. And I've often said that the miracle that would have happened there probably rivaled or surpassed the crossing of the Red Sea. The Exodus account says that the people of Israel grumbled against Moses, saying, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Your tongue feels like a piece of tar from a Texas highway when you're out in the desert. The sun is relentless. They would have cried out for water. And of course, Moses heard their cries, petitioned God. Moses struck the rock and it split right down the middle from top to bottom. The Bible literally says the water gushed from this. I climbed up the backside to the very base of this rock. And right at the base of that split, it's deeply gouged. And the rock on either side, if you look straight up from the inside of that rock, it's really, really smooth, but it's pressure flaked. Big chunks of granite have been flaked from the bottom. And it, it, it's not a normal erosive pattern for granite. Granite generally from just wind and erosion will crack and flake off from the top down. This is coming up as though something came flying up and really gouged the rock. When that rock was split in two, a geyser erupted out of the top of it. It blew those two pieces of that rock apart. It's very interesting. This part of the world gets a half an inch of rain every 10 years. And it's so arid and so dry. Yet this rock shows distinct evidence of water erosion. Not just a trickle, a burst of water flowing from it, washing out the whole mountainside, going down and washing all the sand that's down below it, creating a, an ancient lake bed down below. Now you're talking about anywhere from 600,000 to estimates of up to 2 million people that came out of Egypt. If we were talking about a tiny little rock with a tiny little trickle, they would still be in line waiting to get a sip of that water. This place would have filled with water so quickly that that entire group of people could have come around the edges of this two or three mile long area and immediately taken their fill of water. It's very compelling. If you were to show the picture to somebody and say, well, it came from Colorado or Utah, well, you accept that, but if you say this came from one of the most arid places in the world where there are no rivers. The most graphic description would be found in Psalms. Thou didst cleave the rock in the wilderness and the waters ran down as rivers. And that Hebrew word for clave means to split cleanly in two. There is no such candidate or any other site that has been investigated or is currently being investigated as Mount Sinai. Following their theory of the crossing site, Cornuke and Williams begin to retrace the possible trail of the Exodus route from the Saudi Arabian shore back toward the mountain. Well, if they would have crossed through the Red Sea, at the point that we surmised. The Bible gives us clear indications of what they encountered. 